Would you like to learn about microservice architectures and monolithic architectures? If so, this video is for you. In this video, we will discuss what are microservice and uh, monolithic architectures, the architectural design considerations you should think about when choosing a monolithic or a microservice-based architecture. And we will talk about where monolithic architectures and microservice-based architectures will fit into your cloud architecture or enterprise architecture. So to begin, we're gonna talk about monolithic architectures and the best way to describe them as a single unified code base, a single deployment unit, where everything is inside of something that's nicely packaged. And this could be a user interface, a business logic, data access, but the point is it's gonna run as a single process. This is your traditional application that gets installed on the machine. Uh, anytime there's a change, we have to replace it with a new version. So. If we first look at the strengths of a monolithic uh, architecture for your applications, the first thing we can see is, is very simple. Simple to develop and very simple to deploy. One project, one build, one deploy pipeline. Now this is gonna make it real easier to onboard new developers and there's not a lot of moving parts. So the monoliths themselves are fairly simple. Now, when we look at monolithic applications, what we have to understand is it's one big code base. So there's not a lot of overhead going in back and forth from, across microservices from say a network perspective, because it's all in there in that same code base. We typically have lower CPU and memory because it's all one contained thing, as opposed to managing communicating to a whole lot of different places. So often very efficient for and performs very well. Now, monoliths are old and mature technology, which means there's lots of established tools for monitoring, logging, and debugging. And there's plenty of people with the skill set for uh, monolithic applications and tooling. So there's that as its strengths. Now, there are, with any architectural option, there's these design trade-offs. So let's talk about the weaknesses of uh, monolithic architectures. Well. Scalability to a degree. See, with a monolithic uh, architecture, every time we need another application, we pretty much another instance of the application, we typically need another server. So that means if we've got an application and one component of the application is taking up everything, we're going to need a new server for that because we can't just scale the one little component of the application. We have to scale the entire application. Now, this uh, means it's... Uh, not going to be as efficient as possible when it comes to adding capacity when needed. Now, one thing which could be good or bad is the speed of an application release in a monolith. It's typically slow. It takes a fairly long time to build, test, and deploy a monolithic application. It takes less time to do that with a more microservice-based process where you can push it out there. Now, when you have a slow release cadence, you actually have the opportunity to really test this stuff and make sure it works. So you may find environments like a nuclear power plant, for example, that needs good, strong technology or an airplane. And they're not looking for weekly releases. They're looking for stability. So slow cadence release. Now, there's a very tight coupling in a monolithic architecture, which means if you change one module in it, it can potentially affect others. So you know, we have to be careful with this and make sure that members of the team don't step on each other's roles when they're coding these applications. And uh, when we're writing a, or the, or the uh, software developers are writing the code for a monolith, it's typically going to be the same code in the same language. It's not like we're going to add new, new languages or frameworks very easily. So who's a monolith good for? Well, generally speaking, early stage startups. If they don't need a lot, they can have something that's simple and elegant. Uh, and that's typically a reason you might actually use a monolith. Now in a small to mid-sized business, again, they've got a predictable load of their systems, their growth, if they're not typically, isn't typically extreme, there's very little overhead. So they don't need to get involved in the heavy expenses of having a microservice-based architecture. If you've got a simple project with homogenous requirements, meaning a simple domain, not a lot of integration points, 
now you're dealing with another place that's good for a monolith, especially if we have minimal scaling, vertical scaling that needs to occur. Now let's get into the microservices, which on the surface are really cool and actually are architecturally very cool. The question is, does it make sense? Now a microservice based architecture is really gonna be an ecosystem of small little autonomous services that are typically running in containers and each one will do something. So instead of having one big thing, we might have 150, 300, 500, 1,000 little things out there and they all talk to each other. Now, what's really good about this is if I have 10 different uh, services and one service is a hog and it keeps using up the capacity, we don't need a new server. We can just spin up another container for just that service. So we typically scale very well with microservices. And we can scale based upon demand. So lots of scalability. Another really cool thing with microservices, we can have this agile parallel development. We can have various people writing various little services at their own time and their own pace. And it's not like you've got that same critical path of the project management term of what needs to happen in order necessarily as badly as you would in a monolith. Now uh, we've got this polyglot uh, or multi-language flexibility here. Services can be best suited to run in any language or any framework or any database you desire, and they're gonna connect it to it. And when it comes to isolating faults, it's gonna be very easy to do with a microservice uh, architecture because you're gonna look for that one thing that was bad as opposed to trying to search an entire model of a couple of operations. So does this mean that microservices are what we should use all the time even though it's very cool? The answer is of course not. There's a lot of weaknesses with microservice based architectures too. For the most part, it's complex and that means very sophisticated DevOps, CI, CD pipelines, service delivery, distributed tracing and centralized logging. Now that means a lot of money and that may be way beyond an organization's needs. So another thing that's typically weak uh, with some um, microservice-based architectures in a monolith, it's like an acid transaction. As soon as something occurs, it hits everything. Now, when we're using microservices and there's lots of little services that are talking to each other, we typically get a, this eventual consistency, uh, meaning it's not gonna be perfectly imminent, but it'll be fairly quick. Now, when you're dealing with connecting a whole bunch of little things and they have to talk to each other, that means that we've got a fair amount of uh, networking overhead. And that could mean if that with additional latency, that could mean if there's a problem in the network, we're gonna have more faults than we would if it's inside of the same server. So think about that. And uh, you know, from a governance and security perspective, it's gonna be take a lot more challenges and there's gonna be a need to come up with a real uniform policy for authentication, authorization, and some kind of a service to service encryption. So who's the Microsoft is good, service is good for? Well, huge organizations. If you're a company like Google and you've got 18 million product lines and high transaction volumes, distributed teams, the thousands of developers everywhere, this is beautiful. Now, if we have a company that's pure digital, it might be, and they're gonna have a lot of reuse in their application patterns like a Netflix or an Amazon style business. In many cases, certain things for them may make sense because they're all tech for the most part and they're gonna look, and the only way their business grows is if they're tech scale. So that could be something that might make more sense. A regulated industry. Now here we might use uh, some microservices because uh, we can be fairly control, have some good control over where we can put the data, specifically sensitive data. So that's something to think about. So in the end of the day, we need to choose the right approach. Now the right approach is aligning with business strategy. So if we've got a business that's gonna be in a high velocity market with incredibly frequent feature changes, we really wanna favor microservices. Now, if we've got a stability focused environment, like a nuclear power plant, like an air traffic control system you would hope to be, or, or the systems inside of a hospital, you want something stable and you're not gonna be looking for microservices. You want something that's been tested, slower releases, tested, tested, and tested, and more tested. Now, cost sensitive environments, are often gonna prefer monoliths. Let's look at the team structure, by the way, while we're at it. A small team where everybody's sort of in the same place is gonna thrive with a monolith. 
Now, if I've got a distributed team of people all over the world, and it's not hard to get them to collaborate with each other because of time zones or what have you, well, then all of a sudden, each person developing their own little thing, their own little code base, their own little microservice may make sense. So we really have to plan for, for the evolution of the business. Even a monolithic application can be somewhat modularized to create some clear module boundaries. And that may, if we need to take that monolith and turn it into microservices in the future, it'll be easier to do so. So in this video, we discussed our, what are microservices, the architectural considerations of using a microservice versus say a monolith. And we talked about where the microservices or or versus monolith application architectures would fit into your overall cloud architecture or enterprise architecture. Now, if you'd like to become a cloud architect, an AI architect, a network architect, a security architect, or an enterprise architect, join us in a free architecture webinar. We have a free webinar each week where we go over what we do in these architecture roles, the skills you'll need. And of course, what's on Zoom so we can answer any questions you have about your architecture career live and free. Sign up, it's in the description of this video. It is uh, free, so sign up and I hope to meet you. While you're in the description of this video, you will notice that we have documents to enhance your architecture career. Documents on how to become a cloud architect, or how to become an enterprise architect, or how to become an AI architect. Documents on how to win the interview for your, your architecture position. They're all free, so go sign up for them and uh, let me know your thoughts. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell to be notified of new videos to assist you in your architecture career. This is Mike Gibbs signing off for now, and I hope to see you in another video. Take care.